Please join me in welcoming my friend, Susan Ford Bales. You made my day, Betsy. <clears throat> and the reason that we're running late is in honor of my mother, because she was never on time. Any Betty Ford staff will know that she was never on time. And uh, she even arranged to make her own funeral late. So um, <clears throat> she continues to be an amazing person. So uh, thank you, Betsy, for the too kind of an introduction. But it's always fun to be among staff and friends and, and long timers who I haven't seen in a long time. Um, it's an honor for me to be here today. It's a step in the right direction. And the story that I'm going to tell you started more than 35 years ago. And I'm here to share with you my personal journey. It's a journey that's as significant today as it was in the 1970s. It's a journey that speaks about the devastating impact of the disease of addiction. The impact of this disease on families, but most importantly, on the promise and reality of recovery. I know from my own personal experience and the impact it had on my family. I am an adult child of an alcoholic. And let me tell you, I'm one of the best enablers in the world. So I'm your patient today. Not sure that's what Betsy had in mind, but that's what I planned for. I'm fairly certain that every one of you knows or treats somebody who has struggled with or is still struggling with alcoholism or other drug dependencies. I do feel like I'm preaching to the choir today. This disease is widespread. It permeates every segment of our society, but nowhere is it greater than in the family. And I'm going to tell you some facts that still amaze me, and maybe you need to hear them every day. Sometimes we just need a few reminders. Consider the following. Nearly 25 million Americans meet the diagnostic criteria for alcohol abuse and alcoholism. And each alcoholic negatively impacts the lives of five to seven other people. The progression of alcoholism appears to be faster in women. And more than half of the American adults have a close family member who has had or had alcoholism and approximately four U.S. children under 18 years old is exposed to alcohol abuse or alcoholic dependence in the family. Children of alcoholics are significantly more likely to begin drinking during their adolescence and to develop alcohol use disorders. My own journey with recovery has a common theme. Addiction is a family disease and it is most effectively treated in the context of the entire family. As some of you may remember, when my parents and I lived in the White House, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Dad and I witnessed firsthand how strong mom was through that crisis. And through her experience, I learned that something good can occur even out of the most traumatic events. Even those played out in the glare of the White House and the national media. And I am so glad that we did not have the 24-7 media there that is today. And I'm very proud, and always will be, of how my mom spoke up candidly and boldly about her breast cancer. The strength of her message and her remarkable candor motivated millions of women to get mammograms. And because of her strength and courage, the lives of tens of thousands of women around the world have been saved. By 1977 and 78, I was no longer seeing my mother as a power of strength. I didn't recognize or understand what I was seeing in my mother. I soon learned a harsh reality about her. I began witnessing firsthand the progression of the disease of addiction. In January of 1977, mom and dad left Washington. They left the world of politics, of Air Force One, state dinners, Camp David, 
and all those official ceremonies. And they left behind the lives that they had known all their married life. Suddenly, they were all alone in sunny Rancho Mirage, California. A new life in a new city, without the security of their old friends. My mom was feeling a bit abandoned, and soon and very viciously, her disease progressed. Within the first year after we left the White House, the centering force that had tied the Ford family so deeply to one another was exhibiting what I now know were the unmistakable signs and symptoms of later stage addiction. The strength mom had so bravely demonstrated that you and I admired with her breast cancer was vanishing in front of my eyes. And what I saw in my mom was crushing. I saw women in great physical pain from an old pinched nerve, an emotional pain for her new life. I am the only girl in our family and the baby. I was the only one living in the desert at the time. My brothers were living all over the country. The boys would call me for updates on what was going on with mom, but they weren't really in touch. Mom was taking several prescription drugs and make it through each and every day. Doctor once a week, but her condition never improved. She got weaker and weaker and more and more sluggish. Each doctor's visit resulted in yet another prescription drug being prescribed. The new prescription didn't solve any of the problems. It only exacerbated an already rapidly deteriorating situation. Doctors didn't say no to the former First Lady of the United States. The whole focus of my mom's day had become that handful of pills that got her through until the next handful of pills that got her through until her evening cocktails before dinner. So as her daughter, the decline in her health was very confusing, to say the least, and more than I was able to handle. I was scared. I was scared because I didn't know what was happening. And I was scared because I didn't know what to do or how to help my mom. And soon I was feeling more and more alone. I found myself making all kinds of excuses, horrible excuses, so I wouldn't have to spend time with my own mother. I have since come to learn that that is the natural response for family members dealing with active addiction. It's a survival tactic, and it served me well for at least a part of the time. As for dad, mom's plunge wasn't quite as difficult for him. He was traveling several weeks a month, giving speeches, attending board meetings, and raising money for countless charities. So absence from Rancho Mirage made it possible for him to pretty much avoid or ignore what was spiraling down at home. And of course, with dad off traveling, it was only natural that mother wanted me to come over and visit with her and spend time. She called frequently to join her for shopping trips, to have lunch or dinner or just be there. But attempts to go shopping turned into day-long waits while she tried to get herself ready. She was totally oblivious to the slow pace forced on her by all the pain medication, and it drove me to distraction. It pushed my patience in ways that I have never experienced. It was like watching a robot programmed at slow speed, moving through its paces. But for a long time, I accepted it as somehow being OK. I didn't know any better and it was just the way she was. So joining mom for dinner was just as frustrating. Mom and dad grew up in the era of cocktails before dinner. It was a practice that they had continued through their entire married life. Suddenly that routine became a calamity. And if she had a cocktail before dinner, mother would doze off right before there or at the table, well before the meal was ever over. None of this was very pleasant to witness, and I felt all alone. Dad was traveling, 
and no brothers lived locally to help. So more and more, I tried to escape my new reality by escaping into a life without her. But of course, that was impossible for my efforts to escape to be total. Soon I found myself passively watching her condition deteriorate even farther. I had no idea what to do. I had no idea what was wrong. But I knew that something needed to change, and mom needed help, and I knew I needed help for the both of us. But where was I to find help? In treatment and recovery, there's a lot of talk about a higher power. Well, for one, I am convinced that a higher power was watching out for the mom and our family in the late 70s. When my fear, confusion, and desperation finally forced me to reach out, that higher power brought into my life a doctor who listened empathetically to my story. And he began to provide us with guidance that both dad and I so desperately needed. He was no ordinary doctor. This was a doctor who was in recovery himself, a doctor who knew my mother, a doctor who had been patiently waiting for one of us to finally reach out for help. His own experience meant he knew what was wrong. And most important, we were needed to do was to begin our own journey towards health and wellness. This doctor friend knew an intervention specialist and after the concept of an intervention was explained to me, I knew it was exactly what we were looking for. The first thing I did was enlist my dad. And as you can expect, the form, former commander in chief stepped right up and took charge. He quickly called my brothers, and on April 1st of 1978, we presented mom with the facts that we all learned was a disease, a disease that was killing her. A disease that didn't care that she was the former First Lady of the United States. We each took our turns, sharing with mom specific and undeniable incidences when her disease caused us concern or disappointment. But most importantly, we told her how much we loved her. And when my turn came, I could hardly get the words out because of the tears. But what I was sure of was what we were doing was going to help her. So I found my voice and said what needed to be said. What was hard for us to say was equally difficult for my mother to hear. And the first thing she told us that fateful morning was she thought we were all crazy, <laughs> which I think you all know is called denial. <laughs> so fortunately, Underneath all the pain that she was trying to cover up with pills and alcohol, there was still an incredible woman. Eventually, our words reached her heart and her head. The emotional pain that my mom had so successfully medicated away reached the surface in a form of tears. And then through the fleeting moments of clarity, she began to grasp the seriousness of the situation. She agreed to accept what was being recommended, and she was admitted into Long Beach Naval Hospital shortly thereafter. At the time of the intervention, and when she went to treatment, I thought we, dad, me, and my brothers, were doing something for my mother. But what I've come to realize in the 30 plus years is the fact that we were giving ourselves a gift. And that gift was twofold. I received a sober mom whose legacy is stronger than ever and a family who has embraced recovery. The love, support, and caring that came with this gift has been immeasurable. When my mom went to treatment for 30 days, the rest of us sat back to enjoy a month of peace and quiet. We had finally taken action and agreed that we had a successful intervention. We didn't have to worry anymore, or at least so we thought. I really don't think any of us was prepared for what was coming, 
the most challenging period of our lives, the challenge of our collective recovery. And I've come to realize treatment is just the beginning. It's a wonderful opportunity to begin to work through the denial and delusion that every alcoholic and drug dependent person struggles with. It helps demonstrate there is, in fact, a different way to live our lives. Today, I also know that no one gets well in treatment. It's just a start. Not my mom, not your patients, colleagues, friends, no one. The real work starts with the return back into the mainstream of life and to confront the real life situations. Treatment is the first step of what hopefully becomes a lifetime process of recovery, where we embrace health, the joy of family and faith, and redefine purpose of our lives. That has been my experience and the experience of the Ford family. Little did we know when we were initiating mom's intervention that we were starting in motion a life-changing experience for mom, dad, and myself and our whole family, and millions of others. It's quite remarkable to consider the number of people and families around the world who are experiencing the joy of sobriety because one woman rediscovered her courage, because one woman articulated a vision, because one woman moved ahead with a single purpose marked as much for its selflessness as for its courage. The importance of treating the entire family was a concept in, in its infancy in 1978, with gender-specific treatment, which mom helped pioneer at the Betty Ford Center. That was non-existent. We quickly realized that the entire family needed treatment. It was during this process that we started to learn that we were participating, not just for mom, but for ourselves. It was then that we all began our own programs of recovery. We learned about the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction. We learned that none of us have some magic immunity from the insidiousness of this disease. We also learned about the transformational power contained in the 12 steps of, of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that for a person to truly recover, they needed to go under a psychic change, in other words, to have a spiritual experience sufficient enough to bring about recovery from alcoholism. I used the term higher power earlier, and I share the belief, along with many others, that this awareness of a power greater than ourselves is the essence of a spiritual experience. Mother had a spiritual awakening. Dad and I had a spiritual awakening. As important as meetings, lectures, and therapy sessions were, it was what I learned about and what it really takes to sustain recovery that is most beneficial. And at the heart of my recovery are those 12 well-known 12 steps. My recovery as a family member is evidenced in the balance I seek in emotional, spiritual, and physical life. Achieving serenity is a lifelong process. The precious gifts that I have been given as a result of my recovery, these are the gifts too numerous to list, but I am extremely grateful for every one of them. And just think, when the whole process started, I just wanted to find help for my struggling mother. I wanted the mom I knew back in my life. But ladies and gentlemen, I got that and so much more. So lest you think all of this has a happily ever after quality to you, let me clarify one important part of my personal journey. I wanted my mother to be well, but how well did I want this to say it politely? I'm not sure I wanted her to be quite as well as she became. <laughs> so let me explain. 
1977 was the year my dad left the presidency. It was the year we left the White House. And perhaps surprisingly, that was a year that was a great time for me. For the first time, I was on my own. No college classes, no homework, no secret service agents following me everywhere, and I do mean everywhere. No official White House responsibilities that required me to dress up and act like an adult. No reporters trying to find out who I was dating. And most of all, the freedom of happening was happening with a mother who really wasn't focused on me and what I was doing or where I was going. I was free to enjoy myself however I wanted. As a matter of fact, my growing concern about my mother's health probably made the newfound fun side even more important. I was in my early 20s. The chains of living in the White House as a teenager had been removed. I was ready to have a good time. But then after going to treatment in 78, the mom from the 50s and 60s of Alexandria, Virginia came back. And she came back with a vengeance. <laughs> I wanted to be my brother's not living locally. She was mother in capital letters. And she wanted to be in complete control. And this included control over some of her misguided meanderings of her baby girl. She wanted to know where I was, who I was with, how late I stayed out, what I wore, everything 24-7. And I forgot to mention, I wasn't living at home. There was a second change involving the two of us and the return to mother's good health. When she was taking all those pills and drinking, we sometimes switched roles. I often became the decision maker for the two of us. I was literally the parent in our relationship. And I'll admit, I'm a lot like my mother. The truth is, I enjoyed being in control of mom in those desperate days. But I discovered again, control is fleeting and often an illusion. And on what I know now is we give up living when we try to control others. After mom returned from treatment, the two of us spent time redefining our roles. We started to use some of our new communication tools that we had learned. Our approach was respectful but cautious. We circled around each other for a while. And soon I began to find peace in relinquishing the decision-maker role and surrendering some of the control, some but not all. And what I've come to learn about control is often based in fear. The more fearful I was, the more control I sought to exert. The more controlling I felt, the more out of control I acted. It was a vicious cycle. But then it all began to change. And when I began to be able to talk about how scared I was about mom, our family, and the other aspects of my life, and when I could hear myself say, I'm scared, the fear started to diminish, which was a new form of communication. Identifying and sharing feelings at meetings continues to be a vital part of my own personal journey of recovery. The other, the other realization was, and here's a real shocker to all of you, my mom was my mom. And I was, and will always be, Betty Ford's daughter. Mom quickly reclaimed her role in our family system. And as you know, moms are great advice givers. And if you don't believe me, you can ask my two daughters. Moms would, mom would always offer advice, a lot of advice, even when I didn't ask for advice, and that was 90% of the time. Sometimes the advice was right on the money. God forbid, always all right on the money, Mom. But most of the time, I did follow her advice. And just like any other mother-daughter relationship, I sometimes deeply resented the fact that Mom was often right. But deep down in it all, I loved the time here 
of her just being my mom, offering those words of wisdom and love, and then allowing me to find my own way if I dared. In short, having a sober mom in my life for so many joyous years since 1978 was and is a blessing from God. And that is quite beyond description. My mother and I had a shared commitment to the Betty Ford Center, to the patients, to the family and the staff, and the mission that she established. And I see mother's pioneering achievements to quality treatment and the legacy of her spirit lives on there at the Hazelton Betty Ford Foundation. And mom's legacy lives on most magnificently in the tens of thousands of patients, family and alumni and the children that she touched. Mom's vision, passion, and hard work toward con conquering breast cancer and its effective treatment of alcoholism and drug dependency has without question made the world a better place. Several years ago, she left us to be, as she would say, to go be with her boyfriend. But today and every tomorrow, her legacy provides inspiration, renewal, and hope to those and their families who otherwise must confront this disease that is just unspeakable. I cherish opportunities such as this to tell our own story and tell our journey. So I am proud to share this story with you with complete candor. Mom would only insist upon it. It fills my heart with joy to be given this opportunity today. In doing so, my fondest hope is that one life, one family, and one friendship might bene benefit from this experience that Mom and I have shared with you. But I also know that it brings boundless joy to Betty Ford, the woman that we all admire, and the woman and mother that I love and miss so very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I have been informed we have five minutes for questions and I am not going to be on the panel this afternoon because I have to fly to Michigan because my uncle has passed away. So um, I won't. So I'm willing to do five minutes of questions. Um, if anybody has questions, Hi, Jan. <laughs> I'm not that mean and scary. I promise. <laughs> Um, in our community, in the West LA community, we have a lot of famous people and well-known people. <clears throat> and so sometimes when we run groups, we have these people there. And our culture is very accepting that we know these people are around. When you uh, and your family were doing family work, perhaps in groups, can you talk a little about what that was like as probably the only famous people in the room? especially at the Naval Hospital, um, which that, I, I guess my mother burned it down after she left because um, she loved those st nasty wool blankets that they had there. Um, you know, and we didn't even have family. What we had there is it was family with the patients. There wasn't you go to family. You just went and became like a patient and stayed in the hotel across the street. So it has changed drastically. Um, I think our family felt comfort in knowing what was said there stays there. And as we all know in meetings, that's really, really important. And um, I, I mean, because of us kids living all over the country, my had a brother in, in Philadelphia and one's in Northern California, one's in Southern California, and I was living, um, I was living the desert. Um, in my condo. And um, I did a lot of personal one-on-one -on -one therapy 
Um, and my dad would go to an occasional Al-Anon meeting. With, I mean, he would go to the Al-Anon meeting and mother would go to the AA meeting around the corner. But I think the Coachella Valley is extremely blessed with the AA support that they have there. And, you know, they were just lucky. I think we're all lucky that what is said there stays there. But, yeah, the family was not even, it, it wasn't what it is today, let me tell you. I've been to family several times. Um, so um, I could go to family every week. That's the safest place in the world. I love family. One more. Um, you said after she got out of rehab that, you know, that was just the first step. How did everybody respond to her being so open about her illness and her addiction? Well, when you say everybody, I can only speak for myself. Um, I would say the first six months of, of her being home drove me crazy because all she wanted to do was talk about AA um, and I really didn't care um, let's remember I was 19 years old 20 years old um, and all she could talk about was meeting this and so and so and da, 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 and I was like and the rest I mean that's all she talked about and eventually you know that and I think it's very true of most patients when they first get out that that's their support system that was her support system and um, I was just glad that she was clean and sober. That's, that was, you know, I'll deal with my own issues and whatever. I think the hardest thing that I heard, people would come up, I'd go to functions with mother and dad, or I'd go with dad, and if mother didn't go or whatever, and people would come up and go, your mother is so grateful for what you did for her. And she never told me to my face. And that's really hard to deal with. She never told me. Because I did do an intervention one-on-one -on -one several weeks before, which was the stupidest thing I've ever done, but that I was 19. Um, and she threw me out of the house and told me she never wanted to see me again. So um, there's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. So, um, but, yeah. Any others? Thank you all very much.